And um, we are really happy that NCC Lee is uh, going to be actually our first, um, not really first residency, but the first project, first one that we would like to present in the um, this promo festival, this festival that we call it Prelude because it's really a test version. And her work is going to be presented in our Steklani Gallery in Ljubljana. And actually, we would also like to uh, announce her um, sound walk in Ljubljana. Uh, Besides this, we have, I think, about six sound walks uh, for this uh, festival, two cafes, uh, one workshop, and uh, we produce one very nice text uh, by Yasmina Založnik, and she's going to present in the next uh, cafe. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy that uh, you guys invited us, Zona, uh, to uh, make the first um, festival in situ, let's say, or in ground. And this one, because of the COVID situation uh, and also because of the budget situation, because it's a prelude version, is more limited to our local uh, artists, except and Cecily, uh, that we would really like to uh, yeah, present her work as a one of um, be announced on the last uh, festival walking September. So maybe just for the first quick uh, jump about the festival, maybe we can talk about this also later that I'm not taking too much time. Mm, maybe but, maybe just one thing. Um, you, I think you forgot uh, a special uh, a national radio broadcast uh, yeah, that, will, that Katerina will produce uh, made uh, um, of the uh, <laughs> uh, presenting couple of works that were uh, presented and premiered and uh, featured uh, here at the uh, Soundwalk uh, Listen um, platform. And so, yeah, it will be uh, broadcast on national radio, on arts, art program, uh, a two hour program slot. 22 of September, I think. 22nd. 22nd, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Brane and uh, Irena. And uh, Cecily, yeah, the floor is yours. Hello, <laughs> uh, everyone. I'm uh, here, um, Andrew from Soundwalk September. Jeanette is in Shetland. Nice. It's very mixed uh, public, that's nice. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me for this talk. Um, and also Brana, Irena and Katarina from, did you say Chuna? It's not Kuna, I'm saying Kuna. And Steklinik uh, Gallery. Sona, Sona. Kuna, Sona. Kuna. Okay, yeah. So that means uh, zone in English, this is zone. Ah, okay. Okay. Learning new things in cafe talks. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I will have a, a eight channel uh, sound piece that will play in their multi channel rig in Steklenik Gallery. And it will also be a sound walk um, 5th of September, 5th of October. Um, as part of this festival and also part of Soundwalk September extended, <laughs> extended September. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to that and hopefully to be in uh, Ljubljana. Fingers crossed. Um, so I will uh, do a short uh, provocation that we can hopefully discuss uh, afterwards. Um, uh, so the the title of the <clears throat> talk today is Sound Walking in the Anthropocene, which is quite broad, um, but I will try to um, talk about some things uh, that I focus about uh, upon in my practice, but also some uh, problematics of the the medium that I work with um, to reflect upon the Anthropocene. 
So uh, my starting point for my practice uh, start as a sort of reflection on how to create um, uh, in the Anthropocene or it's proposed called the Anthropocene also suggested uh, names for our current geological era is the Capitalocene because it's not really Anthropos, the humans who have created this, this scene um, with a bit more uh, invasive economic system. Also the plantation scene is proposed and the Cthulhu scene. But this uh, scene that where changing air, water, dirt and rocks, everything around us has been changed and we humans are a part of all natural processes to such an extent that it quite, can be quite detrimental or is detrimental. So this I read as a spatial event, already a sort of scenographical work. Um, in this work, uh, we are spectators, but also some of us are protagonists. And we walk into sort of scene, um, Yes. So what I put into this scene is sort of my work or more reflect upon it, I guess. Um, so work mostly with sound works. And I often spend longer periods of time where I create the works. I live there for longer periods of time um, in Oz, the one in the middle. I, I lived there in for one year and um, I mapped the area uh, geologically, historically, biologically with researchers, also working with the locals and um, yeah, also recording non-human voices, uh, which was my focus. Um, so through field recordings, ultrasound recordings, um, hydrophone, geophone, all kinds, to listen in on the landscape and sort of, for me, uh, re-reading a landscape uh, to include other voices than the ones that we maybe normally hear or listen to um, or um, perceive a place to be, so a sort of uh, yeah, history that is constantly being reevaluated, and who's telling that history and who's telling the story. Um, so I'm trying to tell the story from other voices. Uh, one project that I did in Prague 2019 was a recording uh, for three months uh, with an ornithologist. We tried to recall record all the migrating bird species in Prague, also the, the local uh, birds. Uh, so I worked with the ornithologist there, um, who was very nice, taking me all around the city and with his family. Uh, yeah. And to check ornithologi ornithological events that I didn't really understand anything of, but it was still very nice. Um, and this sound walk uh, was um, a five hour uh, sound walk through a geological, geolocative app, like the one that you see to the far uh, left of this image. I work with uh, two different apps mostly, Locosonic and Echoes. Uh, and Locosonic is more a touristic app and Echoes is I guess more of a like a artist project um, or more artistic projects on it. Uh, and it uses the, the GPS on your phone and your placement to play off sounds. So if you walk in the landscape, there are specific sounds placed around there um, and your movements trigger the sounds. Um, yeah. And I've placed the walk in a way that there's not really a specific trajectory and you can walk for as long as you please and for as long as you like. Um, so you're part of, of making the uh, composition. 
uh, the story uh, in a way. And then, um, uh, yeah, some works were really long. The one in Prague was five hours, and it also um, asks you to slow down, which I think is really nice. Um, so we're all part of an entangled network of different species and entities. A delicate, intricate, vast weave, including all living and non-living things. And I think sound that is quite physical, uh, but also not physical, um, is everywhere around us and goes through our bodies, through our skin. Um, and we can't escape it somehow, we, we're all enmeshed in it, and it's very potent for representing this ecological uh, mesh that we are in, uh, but that we do not always see or take into account. Also, sound um, can tell, of course, different stories, as I said, but also evokes uh, inner landscapes and also is quite unbinary somehow. It's quite queer that uh, you can not really discern what it is you're always hearing. Uh, and it really plays on senses of scale. And yeah, and I think Hirt uh, wrote this really nice um, thing in a text I wrote by you where you wrote the uh, poetic subversive which I think is a nice way of thinking about it, that it is both about reading a landscape and lives and sounds as poetic, but also somehow uh, subversing those places uh, from what they are the usually told and sort of soft, uh, soft radicalism in a way, or yeah. Or not so soft. Um, and GPS and internet are also all encompassing phenomena, a completely integrated part of our ecology. So in this uh, works I also reflect upon um, that uh, humans are a part of ecology as well. It's not only the stories of non-humans, of course, uh, that's a big focus for me, but also that humans are very much a part of ecology and it's not necessarily so pretty, uh, but we are a part of it. So some of the things that you can hear, this is like quite a big um, links, but it's everything from that sounds and sounds of trees drinking um, to avalanches, but also reflections around quantum entanglement. For instance, there is theories that birds can see quantum entanglement. Um, and also that they, for instance, in, in Prague, reading about birds, they have syntax and grammar. If you talk about dolphins and whales, they have more complex languages than us. Um, and also how mycelium looks exactly like internet uh, or neuro threads and things like this. Meshes that are similar and connects everything from the microscopic to the macroscopic. Um, yeah, so whose stories are being heard? That goes both for non-humans and also for humans. So in Lend Me Your Air, I was work working with people living at Tayen, uh, and they were themselves recording the place from um, the sounds of the place that they're from, and choosing sounds and sights. So it's more about uh, the people who are intimately familiar with the place uh, that records, and not me, that comes in as a sort of. Uh, sporadic person, but more people who are uh, enmeshed in a place. 
yeah, so walking, um, I think, is a way of slowing down and can also be seen as a radical act. Walking is, of course, not uh, for everyone. It's quite a privileged thing to do. Um, and I think it's important to also remember that in work, both with uh, when thinking about who, how to facilitate the walk, can it be experienced in other ways than necessarily walking, uh, and also, uh, yeah, reflecting upon walking as other activities, for instance, uh, with migration or um, yeah. So uh, working with geolocation is potential for reevaluating and producing alternative maps that respond to the complex and spatial and social relations intrinsic to the landscape's fabric. And I think that's what's nice with working with geolocation is um, that it opens up a possibility of continuously making new maps and map making of the place um, and showing that a map is actually always performed in a way um, and not a, a static thing. Um, yeah. I'm just showing a, a work here quickly that I really like, which is afterlife. Uh, it's not really walking. But you have to walk to the forest to experience it and then lie down and then you hear a 20 minute sound piece about how your body uh, would dissolve if you would die right there and then and, and then taken as a perspective from then on and days and weeks and then like a hundred years in the future where would the parts of your body maybe be a part of as a kind of meditative event meditative work yeah that i think is really nice so a problematic that i want to discuss with you we're working with this sort of uh environmental and uh i guess political and social uh aware works through geolocation and gps and smartphones i'm still wor uh, working with materials and um, uh, software that is quite uh, unenvironmentally friendly and also like Google and uh, has uh, is intrinsic with lots of uh, uh, regimes that are not uh, democratic. Uh, there's a lot of hidden uh, strata of uh, the things that make up the smartphones, but also where they uh, are wasted. Norway is the biggest producer of e-waste per capita in the world and it's often sent to places also that are already environmentally pressured and also politically and socially uh, often um, already <laughs> kind of unjust. Um, so thinking about this as point of the perspectives that I'm trying to to talk about, then it's important to take into account the media that I'm, I'm working with and what that actually implies, because it's not, although sound is very immaterial uh, and a smartphone can seem quite also uh, immaterial in a way, or the internet, it has very uh, physical, uh, uh, it is physical. So uh, some of the things that uh, I think is important to think about, I don't think we should like stop using internet altogether, of course. I don't think that's the answer here, but definitely as political and social pressure for legal frameworks um, uh, on service providers and hardware producers. Um, creation and hacking of tech, that's long history of that, that uh, Hurt and Andrew know much more about than me. Um, and using other kinds of ways to uh, locate, using phone's camera, for instance, not using GPS or Google, and using fixable products. And then you can also sum up with outlook media, 
and using real-time walking and listening practices. And maybe not walking even, but maybe it's other ways of experiencing a sound walk or sound roll or sound um, bus. Um, and then also the perspective of the non-human spending time with the other uh, is more about being in the other, other's wet living, as Jana Homestead uh, describes it, than necessarily discerning information uh, from non-human stories. It's not like, yeah, spending time with non-humans is more about uh, understanding that we don't really understand each other in a way. Um, then we are all part of ecology, but we try to make our place in it caring and the least amount of harmful. I don't know if this uh, was very long. Maybe it was. And this is the work in Steklinik. And it's a eight channel sound comp composition and that reflects the one uh, proximity between bodies through water and uh, yeah that will be opened on the 18th of September and it's a sound walk the 5th of October and it's based upon a sound walk uh, that was shown in Oslo in June that was uh, following the city's underground sewer systems and contaminated ground and uh, among other things also is recordings from the sewer, underground sewer system in, in Oslo. Thank you, Anne, for uh, taking us on this uh, drift uh, through your work, which um, beautifully brings together um, uh, the questions of our time and, and starts from questions in the sense of, uh, um, like you said, in, an, in a very soft radicalism. Um, it's, um, <laughs> To, uh, to think about what, where we are and where we go to uh, by um, not taking for granted. Uh, um, before I go on, maybe somebody wants to throw in a question, a feedback, a comment. Um, please feel free to do so. Uh, and maybe I have a short question. My question is how you choose the locations for the sound walk. Is this uh, totally in the connected with the work you would like to uh, discover with the sound or it's, I don't know, uh, how, I mean, how come that you go to some particular uh, location with the new sound work or yeah. work? I mean, it's a bit different. Uh, for instance, I worked, um, when I worked in Oz, it's, um, it's, like one of the biggest farmlands in uh, Norway. And it's also where the Norwegian constitution was drafted. And it's also the university for, uh, or oh, what's it in English? Uh, it's the university for uh, biology and environmental studies, mm -hmm. but also economical studies uh, for like bioeconomy. Um, and yes, so that's where you go if you want to study any of these subjects. Uh, the campus park where I made the walk uh, is this um, protected park. It's one of the very few protected parks in Norway, actually. And it's made from, um, uh, from like a, a classical, um, these like sight lines uh, and huge grass fields. Uh, and it has this like very, it has this like one point perspective. Uh, it's built from this one point perspective from the romantics where you could like paint the landscape uh, from uh, one single point. Um, and they have to, if one tree falls down, they have to grow the exact same, same tree. So it's very strictly run. Uh, and it's not very biodiverse. Uh, there's some mix of trees, but mostly it's just fe grasses, fields of grass, which is 
basically a desert for very many species. And I think it's interesting with this kind of um, that they have protected this kind of uh, thinking that is linked with the uh, these ideas of the humans over nature and this uh, that aesthetic is this uh, perspective line that they have from the romantics uh, where human is outside of nature and sort of looking in onto the serene landscape they've created. And then at the same time you have the university there that is supposed to work with uh, sort of uh, uh, taking care of biodiversity, but also subjects that are um, only focusing on how to make enough money out of, uh, of uh, forestry, for instance, or different. So it's, it's a clash of a lot of, um, not clash, I would say. There's a mix of very many different perspectives. Um, and also that is old agricultural land, so it's um, which is uh, in some say is like the start of the Anthropocene or like how it really started to sh be shown in the landscape is when we started to to farm like bigger farms. Um, so it's it was interesting to be there and, and I talked to all of the different uh, faculties there and researchers and studios, students in all the different fields. And um, that was also part of making the work to like listen to these different kinds of perspectives and um, also working with the landscape itself uh, with those kind of reflections of the Anthropocene. So that's one place and then, yeah. But that was, so that was the landscape and, and the place that was interesting to work with for my master. I did my master there. Yeah. And in Prague, I applied for a project and, and uh, I got it. <laughs> and it's really nice to work with birds in Prague because it's a huge bird population there, uh, which is um, much bigger than a lot of other uh, European cities. It's really has a lot of um, diverse bird life that have, are declining elsewhere, but will have thrived in Prague. So it was interesting to to look at that, why that is. We um, have a question from uh, Amy. Actually, it's referring uh, to what you as well mentioned in your presentation as that we are in a post-technological uh, uh, era. Uh, yeah. Which in some way is paradoxical because at one side we are technology and then our lives uh, became almost a unity. And uh, the uh, difference between nature and culture, technology, and uh, um, the, how we perceive uh, what is around us uh, became, um, uh, became very much connected. Uh, at the other side, of course, as you mentioned as well, uh, what Amy asks, uh, um, are you aware of the resources uh, to help calculate the carbon environmental cost of these kinds of work um, that are made with, uh, of course, with technology um, and at the same time make people more aware and want to stimulate them to um, to transform um, or to um, um, the, the world and the world in crisis we are in that is actually caused by the, the same technology. And, um, so the question was, are you aware of resources to help calculate the carbon environmental costs of these kinds of work? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely calculate what it would cost. Now, what it was cost in terms of energy, uh, there are uh, websites to do that and, and calculators to try at least to figure it out. And parts of the sound box that I do um, re reflects around also this issue of uh, using this technology and at the same time what it actually means to use this technology. So it is reflecting upon it as, as you are using it. Um, and I think it's important also to do that and, I, and to uh, stimulate people to critically reflect upon what it means. Uh, yeah, to be in an app or on the internet and, and that it is very highly physical. And then, of course, all the works are relating to 
ecology and disappearing species or um, yeah or also con uh, conversation uh, conservational efforts mm -hmm. uh, or different kinds of reflections around how um, uh, I mean also just stories of non-humans I think is important to 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 just have some sense of closeness to things that um, if you feel like you're uh, closer to the place you live in maybe you would want to closer to a tree the ash tree outside your house then you are more willing to protect it it's not necessarily that i i don't really make um, I, I won't say that i am very um, i don't demand in my works of people to to do anything specifically it's more like i give the information and then i let people sort of use that information as they want somehow um, i mean some of it is quite dark and but there's also lots of uplifting things and i think that's important too um, yeah do that answer <laughs> i don't know Amy, does that satisfy you? Yes, it seems to. Yeah. And um, another element in your work, um, what uh, struck me was as well that you talk about working as a sort of soft radicalism, as a way of um, uh, not seeing working as a, as a romantic form of being the, 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 the human being that is separated from nature, enjoying nature, looking for, to it from outside, but being really immersed in nature, part of it. But I remember somebody talking about walking as becoming plants, becoming plants in the sense of um, the plants of the feet, as becoming really nature. So you are, you are the nature by walking it. Uh, you are not um, separated from it. And uh, by definition, by doing this, you are not consuming, you are not um, uh, taking distance, uh, you are uh, um, completely one with what is around you, which is uh, by the just the act of doing nothing, um, a subversive act. Uh, uh, in our times where uh, nothing is for free and nothing is without uh, a purpose. Um, so, um, uh, the, um, the, it's, it's one of these, these beautiful paradoxes in your work as well, uh, using geolocation or the technology to extend your senses, uh, which you mentioned uh, various times. So I see in, in your work um, uh, the use of, of, of the smartphone, not as a technology, but as an, as an extension of your body, um, which is in a certain way, of course, also paradoxical. Um, Can I comment on, on it a little bit? Yeah, Just because you said this would taking up space and so on, I think it's important also to, like, uh, it's interesting about, like, uh, taking space in general with your body, like, we could, you can see in, um, for instance, uh, uh, protests in the street or, um, I mean, any kind of act, like you see Extinction Rebellion is doing now, just sitting somewhere inconveniently they are just taking up space in being there is also can be quite radical in that sense that your body is just somewhere where it's not necessarily supposed to be. Um, yeah. But also that uh, extensions of your body, I mean, has always existed since we've made tools. It's just a more uh, yeah, complicated tool in a way uh, than a uh, than a hammer <laughs> or what it is uh, a wheel but it's uh, yeah but it's definitely a part of us like uh, it's not really yeah separated we are cyborgs no um the uh... What it is interesting me in your work as well that you talk about Anthropocene and um, uh, more and more people tend to start talking about the Pyrocene, uh, not anymore about the Anthropocene. Uh, and, um, in relation to the many fires, the Pyro, uh, Pyro the as the Greek. Ah, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, because um, uh, we are living in a time where the climate change is so fundamentally um, uh, having an impact on. Um, um, the, on the planet that it is literally burning 
um, our house is burning not only in the symbolical sense but as well um, in the in the physical sense. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> <and> <laughs> you, <laughs> you see that you have a very an interesting water. Uh, did you have any? Did you have Did you have any interest in the fire as a as a topic as well? Uh, um, I mean, I've uh, had fire in, as a sound element, so mm -hmm. uh, usually the uh, it it um, depends on the sound work, but usually it would be uh, also sounds going back. Um, so there's sounds of uh, fires and sounds of uh, yeah other things, glaciers and seawater. Uh, so there's reflections on how the the landscape may have sounded in the past um, and also what it might sound like in the future and it doesn't really say if the sound is from the past or in the or the future so then you would kind of have to uh, yeah, yeah but one uh... the sound <laughs> one thing uh, last week I was in Greece as you know there were very um very severe uh, wildfires in Greece uh, and one of the effects of these wildfires was that the insects that uh, were um, um, that escaping from the fires they all went to places uh, safe places so um, in, uh, in the countryside uh, it's flooded with insects which all make their own sounds. Uh, so suddenly the insects are, not only the birds are back because of the pandemic, uh, but also the insects are back because of the of the uh, many wildfires that, that are uh, um, raging through uh, the, uh, especially the Mediterranean um, uh, area. Uh, so we are living in a completely changed soundscape, but the soundscape of the Anthropocene, uh, that if you take into account the pandemic and uh, the wildfires, is one where uh, nature is coming back. Mm. Yeah, definitely like in, in waters as well in the sea that has been uh, much less noisy underwater. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everywhere really. Um, but that's, uh, yeah. It's really interesting when uh, talking about underwater as well because it has such an impact on fish. But now during the pandemic, then it has been very quiet, and a lot of uh, a lot of fish have returned to sea. Not crazy amounts, but at least there has been like some resurgence. Hmm. We just need to be a bit quieter. <laughs> Not necessarily pandemic, but um, yeah, maybe. Uh, about your work for Spectronic, when we were uh, talking about uh, where you get the some of the sounds, you mentioned some really interesting collaborations. I don't know if you talked about them in detail in the presentation, because my signal was uh, not the best. But yeah, if you can share maybe some some of that uh, with us, I think would be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, some of it, um, there are some uh, sounds from, yeah, I mentioned that there's some uh, sounds from the underground sewer system of Oslo um, that I recorded this summer. Uh, I asked them, contacted them if I could come down and it's actually been closed since we had the terror attack in 2001. 2010. Now I forgot. <laughs> 2001. Um, but um, but then they let me in anyhow, and um, that was really interesting. It's a huge uh, um, complex, 60 meters underground. Uh, yeah. So that was very nice to be under there and being let in to uh, that crazy complex. Uh, and then I also have some sounds uh, from uh, hydrothermal uh, vents that are from the deep sea. 
Um, some of the recordings uh, are from a collaboration I did with uh, a deep sea uh, scientist in, uh, that in 2009 he uh, discovered five hydrothermal vents in the mid Arctic ridge, which is in between here and Pareine, Faroe Islands. Um, and he, I did a project uh, last year uh, that was uh, concerning hydrothermal vents uh, and deep sea mining because they want to mine these vents because they have rare minerals um, and use them, for instance, for computers and smartphones and electrical batteries. Um, so I was working on a project with that and he lended me video and recordings. Uh, from these vents, which was really beautiful. They're absolutely amazing. And they've also found um, some RKA, which is pre-existing of bacteria um, that they think can be uh, the basis for all life on the planet. They're not really sure, but... Yeah, and then... There's also sound from a rowing residence, rowing residency. It was an artist residency, but uh, it involved a lot of rowing uh, for a month in the Northern Norwegian Sea uh, with the dinghy, which was a traditional old wooden sailboat. We rowed and sailed for a month. Uh, we were eight artists who did that. We also hear sounds of that. Uh, that crazy thing and other sounds. Lots of different water sounds. Water bodies both from my body and from rivers and from sewers and yeah. Lots of different way, ways that our water goes. Body of waters. Would love to listen more. Where can we find your work online? Uh, you can listen uh, on SoundCloud, for instance. And then you can also uh, look at my web page. There's some things there that you can listen to. But uh, that's the thing with geolocative uh, works now, that you actually have to be there to experience them. So all of the walks that uh, use uh, GPS, uh, you have to be there physically to experience them. Uh, so you have to be in Oslo or you have to be in uh, Prague or uh, yeah, Bergen, Bos. One day, yeah. That's at one side uh, the paradox, but also the beauty of uh, geolocated media or locative media that it is a very connect connected uh, technology in the sense that it doesn't make sense if you are uh, not connected or on the place itself. Um, yes. and so it is not, um, as many people say, uh, why to use a medium like a smartphone that actually is this connecting you from the reality. Um, at the other side, it is uh, using this uh, technology. Uh, using GPS um, as a trigger uh, for um, for audio contents that are put as a layer over the place, they only make sense if they are, if they are interacting with the place itself and if you are there. Because it's not about the technology; it's about you, um, uh, the you being there. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, mm. It's just a tool uh, to experience a place anew, in a way and really have to being actively there. So, yeah, I think it uh, it is using a tool that could necessarily distance us from a place that very much, uh, as you say, put, makes us closer to, I would say, through geolocative soundworks. But I'm also, because you've also worked with geolocation a lot, Geert. Mm -hmm. I do, exactly. So, You've done so many nice projects. When I mm -hmm. read about it, I just want you to do this talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, well, we, are, we are doing the talk, <laughs> so don't worry. Yes. Anyway, it is indeed, uh, my background is in poetry, but I, from the beginning on, for me, poetry was not something that, that 
it uh, was uh, just written down, just part of a book, but uh, the, uh, part of the whole environment and of the whole body um, uh, that is uh, um, that is reading it. Uh, so um, from the beginning on, I uh, started to um, to make. Uh, locative works even before the GPS or, or, or smartphone existed. And then I became part of an, uh, um, a collective um, which was called uh, No Tools, actually, and, and Escoitar, uh, which uh, was a group of people from very different directions, but all with the same interest in, um, um, in a very human approach uh, to, uh, to sound and to nature. Uh, and then with them, we developed uh, a first, one of the first, uh, even, yeah, even if, well, but it was, it was, let's say, it was the first, but it's not nice to say for me itself, it was the first, anyway. It's uh, the first. Uh, uh, You're allowed access. to say it. <laughs> the, yeah. first open access, the first open access uh, uh, platform. Uh, predecessor of Echoes, of Locosonic, uh, but with a spe specific idea to give an, an alternative for the upcoming audio guides. The audio guides which were giving you a very directed, uh, straightforward, um, um, guided um, uh, the perspective of a city or of a place. We wanted to create a tool that was allowing people or groups of people to work together and bring in their own stories, uh, their own relations with places, uh, that um, uh, so from bottom up and um, to uh, as well allowing you to get lost, uh, not to follow in, in certain direction, but to compose, to to have the agency to compute, compose your own route and to experience, uh, to bring in your own experiences, um, the to be listened to by others. Uh, uh, the, for many years, uh, we made a project based on these principles so that uh, walking or sound walking is based on agency, uh, on, on drift, uh, on uh, not being guided, but uh, creating your own path and to uh, listen to the collaborative experience of a place, the, community, the, the communal ex um, experience of a place. And that was uh, the Notus. And then Notus uh, uh, inspired actually uh, people uh, like Josh uh, and uh, others, uh, uh, like Sonic Maps, um, to, um, uh, to create their uh, platforms uh, that are now still available to make artistic projects. Because it ended in 2016. Yes, exactly. And then we started with a new platform, CGOMAP, uh, yeah. with partly with a team from Notus, uh, but uh, allowing not only sound, but also uh, images, texts, but with the same idea, C for collaborative, that it is not an individual or an, um, um, an, uh, a top down. Um, the, um, um, uh, initiative, but that it is made together with others and giving you an, the possibility to, to um, discover, explore the city on, an, on, on your own way, by, with an own agency. Um, do, you, uh, do you use the, also Google Maps and these things, or uh, how do you uh, build them? Uh, specifically, we don't use Google Maps, but OpenStreetMaps uh, out, Open yeah, okay. out of the concern, out of this concern for the uh, the big company um, yeah. mon monopoly on uh, the, on mapping and technology. Although you cannot avoid it, and it's uh, a matter of being creative with it. It's a matter of being as well to hack it. Uh, it's not. Uh, I don't. I'm not so radical that. Uh, uh, I say that you should avoid it, but you should try to use it on a, on a, on a way that is undermining uh, undermining it uh, on a subversive way, like you said in the beginning as well. Uh, it's uh, not by avoiding, but by trying to use it on a um, on a different and alternative way. So just like the audio audio guide actually inspired us to make something completely subversive uh, for the audio guide itself. It was called No Tools. Hi, um, I'm coming from the performing arts uh, and I'm recently involved with walking projects and I was wondering if you had any 
comments or observations on how the sound walks um, uh, change the performativity of the participants in a way? Or have you ever observed um, from the outside, of course, but maybe also being very much in, um, you yourself, the participants of a sound walk? And I was wondering whether there is some sort of um, a different embodiment of of um, of information, or how I'm I'm wondering how the um, the information received, uh, being sonic or um, different triggers, uh, could change the 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 way one is behaving, or if if they're embodying something, or what kind of performativity in a in a public space or in nature in the forest um, might be. And also, because it's also one of my um, uh, questions, one is how to to embody landscape. It's a, a big question, but then also how to materialize an experience, as in something that is not tangible. How does it materialize? And I was wondering if there's something or some insight to that from um, your experiences. Yeah, thank you for this really nice question and reflection. Mm, I mean, I think it's difficult to say how people uh, experience it because it's so individual. It's not, there's no choreographed uh, path, so you don't have to walk a specific route. But I definitely see people, uh, oh, it's very mixed actually. Uh, People walk very differently. Some are have very like are very focused and have a sort of going like they're go running to work. And some people are like really lying down and just letting sounds sort of um, come and want to spend more time in one place and just reflect upon that spot that they're sitting. Um, well, some. Uh, and it really depends on the kind of audiences as well. I, there's some, uh, like I would say from the art audience that want more just just a, a sound work. And then uh, other audiences who want as much reflections around the place and historically, and uh, yeah, have storytelling really to kind of immerse themselves into the place that they're at, that they need more um, meat on the bone, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but I, I definitely see that there's something happening in the sound box, uh, especially the ones that are longer, that people actually, well, you have some people who fall off very quickly. <laughs> And then some that use a lot of time uh, to listen and, and spend. Uh, I, I think they say that uh, an audience looks at the painting in the museum ar around 10 seconds, or is it less, two seconds? Uh, but I definitely see people spending half an hour, an hour, maybe even two hours uh, with the work and coming back to seeing the work. Um, and also, uh, the sounds that I place are not necessarily in like a logical route that you would follow in the landscape. Mm -hmm. So there's also like behind the trash cans and uh, into where the fence, you have to go behind the, into the fence or places that you wouldn't necessarily walk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's nice that people uh, kind of feel entitled to 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 go a bit off of pist um, and it's I, I don't know I think it's so interesting like I really want to film people that walk it what kind of movements do they do I do experience that they slow down um, mm. but yes um, is I don't have any like physical sort of information as you say to to what actually happens 
besides what people have, have told me. Um, mm -hmm. And how they, yeah, just looking at them. Mm. And, um, yeah. Go on. No, yeah, Go and no, I also have some things like in some walks that I, I have put in, in action. So this like eat from this plant uh, or here you can lie down. Uh, here you can sit down mm. and then you can do these kind of actions um, and then some are more open just that you can do whatever mm. you want. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting that with sound uh, the prominent sense which is vision usually just shifts into something else into hearing and then this becomes the um, the eyes uh, in a way now, uh, many people say that uh, actually sound works um, are um, because they only make sense because they are connected with your with the complete environment uh, you are in uh, that they are uh, not limited to sound, but actually are audio visual, uh, audio visual works or uh, audio visual box, uh, because uh, they are like the uh, the um, uh, the the sound score of a film. Uh, they uh, on, on themselves, the sound doesn't doesn't make sense. It, it is it is it's the unity of the sound with the environment where you become more aware of you become more aware of the environment through the sound work itself. Uh, the, which you can say as well with locative mm -hmm. media, they, uh, eventually they are not about uh, uh, the locative contents, but about the interaction they have with the place and actually the unity they create with the place itself. Um, now, um, uh, the, um, that's the particular particularity of sound working, except of if you look to the, color, the uh, acoustic ecology, the, the, the silent walks, the, the listening walks uh, that try really to focus on the uh, on the sounds itself. But even then, you don't succeed to isolate yourself from where you are. Uh, you are always uh, uh, part of a complete world, and then of all the senses uh, uh, are playing a role in, in the experience. I don't know if you feel like that as well, uh, Anne. Yeah, I definitely think I get the heightened sense of a of the place that I'm at. Uh, and I also like to uh, be in it and take off my headphones. So it's like also a mix of being like in that space and, and returning back to different uh, times, frames in a way of that same place and how the sounds uh, makes the place completely different. Uh, and of course, it also evokes inner landscapes and inner images as well. Um, and yeah, it is also so physical. I mean, the sound in itself combined with the place and, and being at a certain point. Uh, yes, a lot of layers. It's both visual and, and sonic, but also not only the sound work and the place itself, but everything that it evokes. Um, yeah, but I really like that you can play with the scales, I think is something I think is interesting with the sounds that you can go from a kind of uh, uh, setting that you are quite used to, to changing the feeling of scales of your body uh, in relation to the place that you're at, um, depending on on which sounds you're playing and also, yeah, what you're talking about. If you're being in a microscopic or microscopic perspective, you can suddenly be very tiny in the place that you're at. But that's interesting with these choreographies, like it's, it's, I really like this um, uh, afterlife work where you're lying down. So bodily gestures, like I had this one piece in, in the dissolutions in the sound mark where I uh, ask audience to swallow. Uh, so it's just this like s small thing, but it's swallow and then imagine like where the water goes and then it goes like through the body, but then also through 
the toilet and then into the sewer system and then at the end we are we have this like boat trip through uh, the part of Oslo where um, underneath Oslo to kind of both like imagining the imagining where the where your swall uh, spit would go and then you're kind of uh, paddling in it afterwards <laughs> in a way it's kind of nice yeah <laughs> There's not so much paddling. So was that part in... of afterlife? No, sorry. Was so it? That, that was uh, part oh. of. Um, so that was part of uh, my sound work uh, in uh, July, uh, which is part of. So this sound work that is part of. Zona, 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 Teknik, is. Um, is inspired by that sound work that uh, reflects on uh, different kinds of like how we are zona zona okay uh, how we are connected through water so how water travels through in zone okay zona um, how water travels through us uh, to different bodies but also how we are um, yeah connected to other non-humans through, through our guts and yeah so that was the sound work that was first in through Oslo city and then at the end we sailed underneath Oslo there's an underground river so we sailed or paddled through that at the end yeah mm. nice yes it was really nice yeah. Especially after talking a lot about sewer systems, and then you're suddenly underneath there. <laughs> <laughs> First glance. Hmm? First hand look. First hand experience. Yes, exactly. But you also work as a you work as a choreographer. Uh, I don't call myself a choreographer, to be honest. I find it like a heavy word for me to use. Dance maker is something I could uh, work with better, I think, uh, because I'm on, I'm not interested in movement in itself. But then, yeah, finding common grounds or situations, movement, m movement or moving situations where people can can meet, or where I can meet with my um, artistic um, collaborators. But recently I have been working on walking projects and it's, I mean, it's something that kind of um, consumed me gradually or grabbed me gradually. I was lured into. Um, lured into. <laughs> lured into. I think that's the perfect word for it because it, it's a gradual pull towards <laughs> walking projects that is happening. And because it's very much in the beginning, um, I still maintain this kind of um, curiosity and excitement, I, I think. And because also I don't have the weight of um, this is my discipline, this is my medium, so it's, it becomes like too heavy still. So I feel like I'm just playing a bit or experimenting. But I will be doing um, a long durational walk in um, in Denmark, in Aarhus, on the yeah. 20th of September. 20th. And it's part of uh, Walking Landscapes project. Yeah. Mm. Walking Landscapes. Yes, it's run by um, Metropolis Copenhagen. Yeah. Mm. And basically they've asked artists of different disciplines to do 12 hour walks. 12 um, hours? Wow. 12 hour walks, that is, the, um, that is the frame, let's say the format. And each... Um, Every hour on the dot, um, the artist is required to live stream some sort of um, uh, input. Mm. 
of what he's busy with or what he's doing or how he had um, uh, curated this 12 hour walk. So people from home or from elsewhere can follow uh, what they're doing or the whole trajectory, the 12 hour trajectory through those um, 13 videos you are required to do and live stream, um, which are so short, like one minute to five minute videos, uh, documenting what you are, what you're doing, basically. But are you walking these 12 hours or is it many people walking parts or? It, it depends. Uh, I think people have chosen to meet other artists or other people along their way uh, during the 12 hour duration. Um, I have chosen to walk alone, but share my location. So at any given moment, I might be surprised by somebody joining or visiting. I don't know, uh, which I like kind of in, in terms of um, expectation. Uh, not to know that this is a meeting and you, they have to be, but should they want to, they are, they can and they have the means to do it. And my proposal was to, because I'm visiting Aarhus um, back and forth for, for work with a dance company over there. Um, I proposed to walk the distance between Aarhus uh, airport and the city center on foot. And the, the main idea is that the stranger or the foreigner or the outcomer is approaching the city um, on foot, uh, on a slow pace, not uh, fast tracking through bus or through uh, other means of transportation, but walking the, um, uh, it's basically eight hours of walk. Uh, if you walked it, you know, straight. Um, but I will be doing stops also to to organize the material that I'm accumulating on each hour and then to transmit. So I'll be walking 40 minutes and stopping for 20. That's my calculation and I hope it I hope it works. That sounds mm. so nice. Oh, on 20th of this, uh, September. I'm gonna write this down now. I want to see this. So I can log on and see you walking. Um, you'll be seeing the videos that I will be uploading. I won't yeah. be, um, you know, uh, documented for the 12 hours, no. unfortunately. But maybe fortunately, because I don't think, I mean, I also find it very, you know, this, uh, that I have to carry a camera that has a 4G uh, machine that will transmit something. I'm afraid yeah. that it will bring me in and out of any kind of uh, situation or um, world that I will be building. But let's see, it's a, it's a, it's a try. I wish I was, uh, could come um, and walk part. That would be nice. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully you could bring some sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will just uh, walk because... and tell you about the gut. Lots of gross stories. <laughs> <laughs> the sewers. Yeah, no, um, I mean, no, I'm only saying it, I mean, I mean, I'm saying it as a joke, but I'm also interested in <laughs> displacement. So in that sense, you bringing sound from elsewhere displaced, it would make sense. But yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing this slow pace into uh, the conversation and uh, you um, uh, to have brought this, uh, this, this beautiful flow and flux, uh, spills of, uh, of words and ideas um, uh, throughout uh, the evening. It uh, will be time to say goodbye uh, to you um, and to all. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, have a wonderful evening or continuation of the day and see you very soon again. Thank you all. Thank you.